First, uh, thanks for the invite to come along and talk today. Um, what I'm going to do is just tell a very quick story about how we as a business um, really used an open innovation concept to start to move our business into an area that we considered quite high risk and which we perhaps wouldn't have invested in otherwise. And this is around building a portfolio of technologies which we use to deliver what we see as the future of medicine, which is uh, in the area of cell therapy. So um, after all the comments about big companies, I, I kind of stand here a little bit embarrassed because, uh, as you can see, I work for General Electric, probably one of the biggest companies in the world with uh, almost $150 billion of revenue. So you don't get too much bigger than that. Um, and that always raises a lot of questions in rooms like this about how we innovate and, and, and how we keep the company fresh and vital. Now, I work in the healthcare business, and, and this slide just reflects a little bit about what that healthcare business is. We talk about three platforms within that business, one around diagnostics and clinical equipment, the second around information technology and services, and the third around what we call molecular medicine. And this is the area of the business that, that, that I work in. I work in the life science business. And many of you might be more familiar with the GE life science business if I call it Amersham or Pharmacia. So business that has been around for many years, which was acquired by General Electric in 2003. So that business is about uh, really putting in place tools and technologies which are used in academic research, drug discovery, but also critically, which I'll talk a little bit more about today, in the manufacturing of pharmaceuticals, particularly the newer generations of, of, of pharmaceuticals in the biological area. So monoclonal antibodies, therapeutic proteins, and as I'll mention in a moment, uh, all the way towards uh, thinking about uh, cell therapy. So when we think about innovation within the life science segment, I was, I was sitting and reflecting as we've, we've talked this morning. It's quite interesting, in our life science business, probably two thirds of our product revenue is based upon technology, IP, which has come from outside of the business. And in fact, the largest products that we sell today, which is uh, technology which is used for purifying monoclonal antibodies, we've been through three generations of that technology. All three generations of that technology has come from discoveries that have come from outside of the business and have been in licensed into the business. So in licensing, technology partnerships, acquisitions, very significant part of our business, largely because I think as Patrick reflected, for a business, no matter how large it is, particularly in this very vibrant biological sciences space, it's really difficult to be able to find the level of investment which allows you to capture the massive number of ideas which are being generated around the world. So the only way really to work this is to utilize the things that we're good at, which is often development, producing a final product, manufacturing it, getting it to the market, but the real discovery and research engine that drives our business often comes from outside of our business. So you'll see that I've, I've ringed, I've circled this, this, this title here, Bioprocess, on this slide. Now, Bioprocess business is about a $2 billion business, and it's entirely focused towards really uh, delivering tools into the pharmaceutical industry, which are used in the manufacturing of, 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 of biopharmaceuticals, for example, monoclonal antibodies. And this was, has been a great business over the last few years because we've gone through successive waves of, of discovery and, and marketing of a whole range of new biological medicines. Firstly, with replacement therapies, such as insulins and growth factors, and then, particularly today, monoclonal antibodies. And, and, and monoclonal antibodies have a market of around $60 billion as a therapeutic today. Biological medicines in total account for about 20, 25% of the medicines market and are growing at a double digit growth rate compared to small molecule medicines which are down in the low single digits. So very vibrant area and as we looked at what the future was going to be, we started to realize that if the future of science really pays off, we'll start to see an emerging generation of cell therapy hitting the market probably over the next five to 15 years. And our real question was, how could we move from being simply a tool provider for manufacturing of proteins and biotherapeutics, how did we create a new toolbox which could be utilized really to work in this area of cell therapy and deliver cell therapy to patients? So it was essentially a question of our market today is here. How do we move our market in the future towards cell therapy? And really, when we started to think about this about seven years ago, 
Um, we started to think very conventionally. We've got great scientists. We've got great marketing people. Really, all we need to go and do is to figure out a market analysis, take that market analysis, put it into R&D, and they will produce the products. The challenge with doing that is that, that essentially the market is very undefined, requirements are undefined, it's very fast moving, and the opportunities out there are completely bewildering in terms of the number of things that you could possibly do. So we very rapidly learned that, that this was not going to be a model that worked. And rather what we chose to do was really redirect our internal efforts more towards working with a bunch of partners, really to figure out how we would populate the critical activities that you require in manufacturing of a cell therapy. Um, and, and this has been an interesting journey. Um, it's been a journey over seven years, and as I say, we've more or less moved all of our research from internal discovery more towards working with partners. And our role in those partnerships is really to make sure that we develop those technologies into final end products which are suitable and robust for the market. And really, you know, um, our lawyers don't like us writing too much on slides in terms of those partnerships, but I can, I can tell you a little bit about some of those. So for example, in areas such as cell purification, we've worked with businesses such as Thermogenesis, Cytori, around tools for manufacturing in the clinic um, and isolating the clinic stem cells. We've worked with leading um, healthcare institutions National Institute of Health, Karolinska Institute, really about figuring out how we would create that workflow and validating some of the technologies in that workflow to come up with a robust and safe way for manufacturing clinical therapies. And that's really been a, a tremendous experience because we found ourselves participating in clinical trials of some very new therapeutics, for example, cancer immunotherapies, utilizing technologies around, uh, around cell expansion, growing cells in large scale, which uh, really look very exciting from a, from a, from a patient perspective. Uh, third aspect, we've had collaborations with small companies developing um, microsurfaces for growing stem cells on. And really the interesting thing about that collaboration is that we've linked a small company with basic IP. We ourselves actually don't know how to manufacture that technology, we're working with a very large material science business where they will provide the manufacturing technology. So you see a, a three-way collaboration between a basic science, in fact an academic organization providing basic IP around surfaces for stem cell growth, our business that has an interest in that market, and a big uh, surface chemistry business who can actually output the product. So we've really come to the conclusion that, that, that partnerships have been absolutely critical to populating this workflow. Um, it's been a tremendous journey. And I think the other thing which, which the partnerships have allowed us to do is really to gain access and work with the market to really figure out what the market requires in this space. And so one of the early exercises that we did as part of this um, was, was in, in the first years of our, of, our, of our adventure in cell therapy was really to think about going out, hosting symposia, workshops, where we were very open about, we want to go into this market, but we actually don't know how to do it. And that was actually where many of our first partnerships came from. So the approach of going to the market, admitting that you don't have an idea how to do it, and then asking other people how to do it, does actually work. So finally, um, there's the kind of question, what's in it for us? Because I think, and you know, we've touched on this a couple of times, there is inherently a conflict between a, a very big company um, and, and small entrepreneurial businesses in, in terms of you know, what we're trying to achieve here. So I've just kind of summarized some of the things I think we've already talked about. I mean, we went to a partnership model because we really did not want to take the whole risk within our business. We're confident that cell therapy will emerge, but we don't really understand the timescale over which it will emerge. And we don't understand whether it's going to be a $200 million business, billion dollar business, $2 billion business. And so a lot of inherent uncertainties in there made us want to work with partners to share our risk. That gave us access to a lot of technology, a lot of expertise at a very early stage in its development, allowing us to shape that development. And we believe it's been uh, critical in allowing us to build, as a big company, a position in this market, market very rapidly. And uh, you know, actually a, a more portfolio-structured approach which allows us 
to participate in many different activities, balancing the risk in the business. For our partners, one of the things we've been able to do, which I think they've been very happy about, is really get their products to the market very quickly because they've been able to plug products very often into a, a large global sales force, which really gives them access to a market which they couldn't really achieve as, 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 as small or medium-sized businesses. And I think the other thing that by working with us, there's been the opportunity to leverage not just the life science business, but the fact that in the healthcare space, we have a very large presence. So working with our teams has tended to allow uh, smaller companies really to get a bigger and more holistic viewpoint on how the market's developing and also to be able to access some of the key people who are leading those market developments. So that very quickly is a, is a, is a brief summary of, of, of what we've done. Um, of course, we didn't know that we could or should call it open innovation. But um, back to the comments before. But uh, I mean, for us, this is a very successful approach. And I think, you know, we... Uh, uh, we think that this is uh, absolutely, definitely the future of our business. We will be a development house, a marketing house, a commercialization house. But with so many things happening in the life science space, we are never going to be in the business of discovering very basic technologies. So with that, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Burning questions? I should have, should have said all the slides will be on the SBC website on Monday for those uh, who, who want access to them. Please. Uh, Nigel, I just wondered how open your open innovation is if you can't talk about the partnerships that good you have. Good point. Yeah. I, th I, think it's a, I think it's a really good question because, you know, this comes back to the sort of point that we have with, you know, Patrick mentioned that, you know, sometimes getting a set of slides through legal review can take quite a long time. But actually, we have a lot of ability to talk on occasions like this directly with scientists, work in workshops. So, you know, it's a mixture, and I think all organizations are like that. You have things slow that slow. are real slow processes, but you also have a lot of opportunity and willingness. And as I say, you know, in this, in this adventure that we've been going through, we've probably put 15 different agreements in place with partners. So. The lawyers restrict us a little bit in terms of sometimes what we can write down, but the practice is that we can get some of these things done. I know we're trying to do something with SBC at the moment, and we have you know, many of those kinds of challenges going through that process. But I mean, my, I often say I negotiate for GSK for a living, and I often say my, my negotiations in-house with our own lawyers and our own intellectual property people are far bloodier than anything externally. Yeah. Yeah. But it's changing the culture, and, and now we have a, a, a somebody in CIP whose job title is uh, Director of IP in Open Innovation. So it's changing. We're getting there. Let's have a question. Hello. Uh, Robin Mayton, Magdy, UK. Aren't the challenges you face essentially quite different from GSK? Yeah. You're essentially looking at commercialisation and exploitation of technology. Yeah. As long as you pick the right areas, then there's got to be a market there. Yeah. With GSK, they're playing a huge sandbox experiment with their malaria project. They're releasing data. They don't have a model yet, I don't think. I don't know. It's evolving. Uh, how you make money from that? Yeah, no, I, 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 think, I, think, I think, look, you know, I mean, I have tremendous sympathy for pharmaceutical companies because the complexity of what pharmaceutical companies are doing is orders of magnitude different. If I have an R&D project that lasts beyond two or three years, I'm getting extremely impatient if it's not delivering a product. I, I gotta admit that was one of the reasons why I left the pharmaceutical industry, because it's just so frustrating. But yes, but you know, it's um, it's 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 similar in the sense that as as large institutions, you know, we all struggle to come up with new ideas and we all struggle to find the best way to deliver new types of products to the market. 